Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your grace. And Lord, we thank you for all of your people that have gathered here this weekend, but who have gathered here this morning. Lord, I pray that your blessing would be upon us. Thank you for that powerful presentation that gives us hope that we can, as your body, as your people, uh, as we see ourselves as your hands and feet, eyes, body here on earth, that we can make a difference, that we can uh, deal with some of the issues of our day. You told us, Lord, to subdue uh, this society. And Lord, you sent your Holy Spirit here to help us and to lead us and to guide us in the truth. And Lord, you've given us your word here and said if we abide in you and your word abide in us, we can ask what we will and you will do it through us and in us. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to uh, be able to order our steps by your word. So guide us this morning as we teach your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What well, do you have your? Is, is that okay? Is is it okay? You guys got it adjusted. It's okay. 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 <laughs> If you have your Bibles this morning, open them to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading and my, my text, my teaching is going to be taken from uh, verse 23 through verse 29 is going to be our study this morning. Uh, What we're going to do this morning is, is talk about justice leaders for the 21st century. We, 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 we know the problem. We've heard the problem. We know the problem. Uh, God is a solution. The church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. The church is the answer. So we know the problem, we have a solution. What we don't recognize is the fact that we desperately need each other. It is in that unity, when we come together and develop that, I call it body, I don't know where we'll ever get world unity, but I think we can get body unity. We can get, they was on one accord at Pentecost. And they went out and they changed the world. So I think we can get body, neighborhood, community, unity. And we can become that light. We can be that light, as Jesus says, that shines in darkness. We can be that, uh, these people from Capernaum who have the people there have seen a great light. And the Bible says that light shines on. He came into this world to deposit that light. And that light can shine on. And we are to be now that light of the world. And he's already told us to let our light so shine before the world. That they would see our good works. This is not just the work when we are celebrating inside the church. We have defined the church primarily as the good program we can put on and the emotional display we can make inside the church. That's wonderful. But the whole idea of coming together for the worship is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And the ministry is out there in the world, rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying. And that's our work. The Bible said, as he was, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and healing the sick and taking care of the poor. And the Bible said, as he was, 
So are we in the world. We are his body. And how do we do that? We need to be preaching today for a purpose, for more than emotion. But preaching to help people, yes, get emotion for action. And so that's what we doing. You know how I do scripture. I come with my burden. I go to the scripture with my burden. Then I get into the scripture and I try to find a place in the scripture, uh, a passage, an event that is relevant to my problem. And then I go to the scripture and look at it. And I try to find out how do they solve the problem then. You, you, you see, the Old Testament is about uh, God, how people behave when God is in their midst. And the Old Testament is about when the people disobeyed so much, God left out of their midst and it allowed the enemy to come in and to cap them. And so the Old Testament is about how people behave when God is in their midst. And the New Testament truth is that Jesus wants to be in our midst all the time. Even when our church activity pushes him outside the door, outside of the building, then he stands outside and he knocks and he says, let me in, let me in. Well, I can't get in, but you that come in on the outside, I'll go into you and I'll organize you and I'll be with you. And so God is with us. He says, Lo, I'm with you even until the end of the world. And so God is with the church. The, the biblical thought is that when this age comes to an end, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit will be taken away. And then all the corruption will come to its course. Destruction, it will come. And then God will then purify the earth and he'll come down. And that kingdom that we are reflecting here on earth. That kingdom then will come down to earth. And that will be the kingdom that we will reflect in down here on earth. It is coming. It is a reality. It's going to come. But in the meantime, we are salt and light. And through the Holy Spirit, we are pushing those forces back. Pushing those forces back. And so we are to be God's people. That's what the church is about. It's about more than just me. It's about me joining with my brothers and sisters and we becoming a body, a people, in a community so that we can do the will of God. And, and so let's go to our text this morning. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. By faith, Moses. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was a, not an ordinary child, and they was not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he grew up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose rather to be mistreated along with the people of God than, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded the disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures in Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not destroy the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the peoples passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. My talk this morning is about leadership. What kind of leaders, what kind of people ought we to be? What kind of leaders we need for this 21st century that can make a difference. And so I'm calling my talk then Justice Leaders for the 21st Century. Justice Leaders for the 21st Century. Do you recognize the fact that justice is the all-inclusive concern that God has? 
to think about being Christian and not understanding or thinking about justice is to not be a Christian. Because we were left here on earth to be God's justice agents here on earth. Both in the way we live and both in the way we reflect it upon society. Justice was the motivation for God's redemption. God created the humanity to have intimate relationship and fellowship with him. We was created for the praise and the glory of God. When Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, he created a major crisis. He almost defeated God's purpose. God's purpose was that he would live in us, that he would have an intimate fellowship with us, that, 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 he, could, that he could take us into his bosom, and that he could love us. He created us for his own pleasure and his own glory. But when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, God can no longer take this, this fallen humanity, this snake, into his bosom. God is in trouble. And now God has got to work out a way to keep Satan from winning that he can still take us in his bosom. And so God worked it out. He worked it out. So that he could still be just, because God is absolute just. There is no shot of turning with God. Now this just God got a problem. How can he now take this snake into his bosom and love them? And how can he still be just? Because we would contaminate a holy God. And so God had to work out his own problem. So God had to become a person. That's what the incarnation is about. And the eternal God was made flesh and dwelt among us. God was working out his own redemptive plan. And he showed us what God was like in Jesus of Nazareth when he lived. Then he went to the cross and there on that cross, he died. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us back to himself. Yes, Paul had it right when he said, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He that knew no sin was made sin for us on that cross, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so God worked out his own redemptive plan so he can go on being just and justify you and me in society. Now, how should this just people should live? Micah told us this. Micah is summarizing all of God's concern for the humanity. He has shown the old man what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly before our God. Now let's see then what kind of leadership that can pull us off. That's our task this morning. And so leadership. Let me then define uh, what is a leader first. Bill Hyber in his book, uh, courageous leaders really define a leader. He says a leader is a person who can turn vision, all of God's work begin with a vision, turn vision into passion. Former President Eisenhower says, and that's the model I use, uh, a leader is a person who get other people to do exactly what they want done and they do it because they want to. And that's why, that's why I got Noel, and that's why I got Gordon Murphy, and that's why I got all these other folks. They are doing what it is we want done, and they are doing it because they want to. That's leadership. 
Leadership is, is, is servant leadership. It's so nurturing the people that you are leading that they get the joy of doing the task in life. That's leadership. And we've already defined justice. Let me just do a little something with vision. Because you got to know that. It's, it's, it's turning uh, vision into passion. When, whenever God has a problem in the Bible, it, it, he flashes himself to some people. He sort of shows himself to some people. In the Old Testament, they called it, they called the prophet a seal. It, it meant that he had had a little vision from God. A vision. So you got to have a vision. A vision. Without a vision, the people perish. So in the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophet, when God got bogged down in a problem, he would flash himself to a person. And that would be for that person a vision. And a vision is to see what God sees. N not see what you wanted to see. A lot of times I meet the people, I'm a ministry person. And I meet a lot of people coming to me talking about what they're going to do. It's a, a self-thought-out vision. It's many times it's a self-promotion. Many times it's people trying to bring credibility to themselves. Trying to be significant by using people. We're talking about now seeing what God sees. All of the Old Testament prophets, they were able to see what God We're going to see that this morning. He's going to meet Moses at the burning bush. And he's going to say to Moses, Moses, do you see what I see? What do you see, Moses? I see my people in Egypt. And they are in slavery. They're in misery. Moses said, I saw that uh, 40 years ago. And I tried it, but I didn't make it. And so now, God, since you uh, see it, why don't you take the responsibility and do it? But he said, I come down to use you to do it. So the person that gets the vision, God then wants that person to activate that vision. That's what leadership is about. Leadership is about vision and about leading other people into that vision so that we can solve that problem that God has in society. We are workers together with Christ. And so a vision is to see what God sees. And not see it the way you want it to be. But you see it the way God sees it. And then you're gonna, you don't get God on your side. You get on God's side of the vision. Moses, God said, I've come to lead my people out of Egypt. Moses, you're going to be the instrument to do that. In society. Now what? So we understand vision. Then what is leadership made up out of? What is the stuff? What is the stuff of leadership? The stuff of leadership is energy, 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 energy. And while we are fighting this war in, over there in Iraq, this war, and what are we fighting about? Energy, 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 energy. Energy is the way God accomplishes his task. Energy. So you got to learn how to manage energy. Uh, so the first deal, and, and what we're talking about now, is human energy. How do we get human energy organized around the problem? Or organized around vision? Around the concern that God has? And we're saying here, God is concerned for the poor. Uh, this is what CCDA, I hope, will forever be. We can't be everything. We can let the people back in the big churches design how beautiful they need to be and what flowers need to be on the pulpit and what color the carpet. We'll let other folks do that. I think what we want to do here is make this as an organization, sing a purpose, sing a purpose, sing a purpose. We're committed to building community and family among the poor in the world. And we're going to join with all those other organizations out there who want to do other good things in the world. We're going to join with them. And as much as we can, we're going to help them. But let's make this a single-purpose organization to doing Christian community development among the poor. And I know people are always be coming to me and saying, well, we need this out in the suburbia with the rich. Well, let the rich come and learn from us. Let the rich come and learn from us. Let the rich come into the ghetto and live with us. And let them go back to the neighborhood and do it. 
do it. But let's keep our focus uh, on the poor in, in, in society. Let's love the suburbia. Let's get all the money we can get from them. Let, let's get everything we can get from them. You know, let's really love them. But let's keep our focus on the poor in, in, in the society. Let's put our energy in getting people to relocate and live among the poor in, in, in the society. And so we, energy, energy. So, so leadership is organizing energy, organizing human energy. What is the other ingredients to go into leadership? Is intelligent, intelligent. You can bring all in, see, good leaders know how to manage intelligent. And that's usually the weakness with us minister type leaders. Because we got the vision, we think we have to know everything. Moses had the vision, but he didn't know much. He got Aaron, and he got all these other folks around him to hold up his arm. And it happened. He brought Joshua around him. He brought Caleb and all those people around him in society. The hardest thing for us to do then is to bring these intelligent people around us. You know, I'm sort of a third grade dropout. And in Mississippi, the people were dying of diseases like sugar diabetes and other things down there. And my wife got so concerned about it. And then she began to worry me every night talking about the poor and all of that. And I said, we need a, we need a health center. And so she talked about it uh, a lot. And so we got us some people out there, got us a nurse and some other people, and we begin to go out and uh, do surveys and think about the poor. And, and we started a health center. And, and we got some doctors and, and got going. And these health centers are now springing up all over. And people would meet me and they would say, you're talking about building a health center. Are you a doctor? I said, no, I'm not a nurse even. I said, but I know when people are sick and I got hired doctors and nurses, and they can make them well. I don't have to know everything. What I need to do is to lead everything, not to know everything, and find the people with the skill and the knowledge to do the work in society. So a leader must ha have intelligence. Uh, number four, what a leader must have, is must have character. Christian leadership leads out of character. Character and integrity. That's the idea. What you see is what you get. A leader, a real leader, is a person who is teaching Galatians 5 and is trying to internalize that into his own or her own life. That's called the fruit of the Spirit. That's what integrity and character is made out of. That's what discipleship is all about. Discipleship is to shape your character. And to perform, to perform, produce a little holiness in you, a little uprightness in you. Then let's look at leaders. We know now what a leader needs to have. Let's look then at Moses and see what we can pick out. Now, what I want to do here quickly, I want to pick out the seven, let's call them for the conversation, uh, virtues. Let's call them virtues. Let's call them these, we can call them principles. What do you want to call them? I want to pick these out of us right quickly. And the idea here now is that these are the principles that develops indigenous leaders in the community. Y'all got what I'm saying now? We are now fixing to raise up leaders. We are now fixing to reproduce Moses. Moses. And we'll say Moses was the justice leader for his day. Now what I'm looking at now, how do we produce the justice leader for our day? And so I'm going back to Moses, and I'm seeing then what produced Moses. Then I'm going to say then, let's bring these principles back to our community, and let's produce Moses in society. Moses wasn't born with all of these extraordinary talents. These talents was molded in him. And so it's our responsibility as the people of God. That's what the church is for. That's what the Sunday school ought to be about. That's what the discipleship is about. It's about us molding these leaders at the grassroots level. Let's look then at what produced Moses. I'm going to pick out seven of them. 
Then my idea, y'all take these seven and go back to the community. I'm short on time. This is an hour and a half lecture. I'm trying to push it into 45 minutes. It says, look what it says here. By faith, when Moses was born, was hid three months by his parents. Moses came from a family. Moses came from a family. The family is God's first base of nurture. The first message I gave here was when the foundation, the family, is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Moses came from a family. You can tell in the Bible when God is fixing to do something significant as you read the Bible. He always starts with the family of the child that he's going to bring into the world. You, you look at the Bible, when the prophets fail, I mean, when the, when the priesthood fail, God is now finna go to the prophet. Where did the attention go? The attention goes on al Qaeda and Hannah. God lets us see the kind of family that Samuel is going to be put in. He's going to be put into a loving family. He flashes at family. In, 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 in the closing of, of Genesis, in the opening of Exodus chapter 1, you see the children of Israel in, in misery. And listen to God. Listen to what God says in chapter 2 of Exodus. A Levite went out and took a daughter of Levi. Moses is fixing to be born. We have got to fix the family in our society. That's fine. So Moses was growing in the family. You're going to see around him is Aaron. You're going to see Myra, his sister. You're going to see this family. And so number one, folks, ministry has got to fix family. Family. Uh, I remember that I was out in, I see Pat here. I was out in, out, out in, uh, Iowa preaching. And I was out there, this is early on. And of course I got into preaching out there in that part of Iowa. They don't see a black person very often, you know. And of course I happened to get out there in Iowa. And that Sunday morning, the boy, in this Christian Reformed church, I mean, everybody was out there. And they were out there. And I thought they was all coming to see me and, you know, hear me. And, uh, and, and I, you know, I, I was feeling a little good about my ego and all of that. And, and, I, and I wanted to know why was all these people coming. But I would feel embarrassed to ask the pastor, is, is they coming to see me? You know, I didn't want to say that. So I had to think of a way to say it where I wouldn't embarrass myself. You know, you, you know, and I said, uh, I, I said to, uh, Dan, I said, Dan, um, uh, uh, how many members do y'all have in this church? Dan says, we don't count members. We count families. This church is here to minister to families. We got to get the church ministering to families, pulling families back together. Again, number one family. Moses came in front family. Number two, it says, by faith. By faith. What is faith? What is faith? Where do faith come from? Faith is born out of obedience. And faith come, is born out of the word of God. The root of faith is the word of God. Faith is to obey God. Obey. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then the Bible says we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And so if we can bring people back to obeying the word, then faith is going to be generated in our society. In our society. Yeah. So faith, we've got to generate Faith. That's number two. That's number two. Number three, it says that they saw that Moses was a, a special child. They could see that Moses, that God had given them Moses for some noble purpose. So the word you want to write down is purpose. Purpose is the way we carry out obedience to God. 
What made Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego so powerful for 70 years in that Babylonian captivity? Because what did they do early on? They purposed in their heart what they was going to do. They purpose in their heart. It is purpose that removes us from instant gratification. That's what's getting us in our ghetto now. Our young folks who are coming up without purpose, then they're going to use all of their resources on their own image in society. They're going to become only consumers. Purpose is that which is set out before you. Purpose is that which is out in front of you. So we got to give people some gold. Purpose in life. And how do we do that? And the reason people are self-destructive because they are purposeless. They don't have purpose. So every time I talk to some young people, what I do to them, if you come to our center, and I talk to them all the time, they want Grandpa Perkins, I always talk to them. And always I talk to them, I ask them this, what are you going to do with your life? And I say, I don't care what you do with it. I say, you, you, have you decided to be a fireman? You decided to be a police? Let them be that. But don't let them live their life without a purpose. Otherwise, other people will fit them into their purpose. And so people need to have their own purpose that pushes away from them self-gratification and destruction and consumism. And our people are caught absolutely with consumism in our society. And they're trying to find their identity and their worth by what they wear in society. And so we got to help young folks get a purpose, purpose, purpose in life. And so we got to nurture that. We got to give people the idea of sacrifice. They got to give up something. They got to give up something today for tomorrow. I remember my children, they always wanted a bicycle. And I would say to them, well, what we'll do, what I do is I match every dollar you save to get you a bicycle. And when you get bicycles, it was about $50 and $60 way back in the end a piece. And, and I said, I'll match every dollar you save. And sometimes I throw an extra dollar. And when they get the $65, I said, well, we're ready now to go buy a bicycle. They all said, Daddy, do you know what we can buy a used bicycle? <laughs> I, I like that. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to get rid of the whole $60. They didn't want to invest it. I, I was teaching them how to sacrifice. They, they, they would have been glad to spend my 60. They wouldn't have thought nothing about it. But they had some investment in that. They had to learn how to delay their instant gratification in life. We got to bring that back to the community. Because if we keep on telling people that a Toyota make you fly and don't give them a job and help them to earn it, they're going to carjack yours. I go to the prison. I go to the prison. I work in the prison. I didn't know this. Until recently. Drugs is number one. Number two, my boys are there, and drugs are probably related to that too. But my boys are there for carjacking cars. They carjack cars and keep them for a whole week. And then, then they turn them back in, you know, they leave them somewhere. They carjack. They carjack. If they had a skill and could teach them how to delay that instant gratification and get a job, and that would become meaningful for them. Let me continue. Purpose. So we got to work on helping young folks to get a purpose in the neighborhood. Teach them how to save. Teach them how to earn. Uh, and teach them the idea that their identity, they are created in the image of God. And this materialism, wearing somebody else's name, don't make them anything. They are already something without that name. Without being exploited by these football players. And these commercial people in society, we got to help them to get real purpose in, in life. Number four. Uh, that was one, one, two, three. This is number four. <laughs> number four. He was not afraid of the king's commandment. Moses came from a family of courage. Courage. we got to nurture courage in people. Uh, what is courage? Well, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is to do one's conviction in the face of fear. It's to be so convicted that what you are doing. A few years ago, uh, 
in Mississippi, they they made me the man of the year in Mississippi. That you know that felt pretty good. The man of the year in Mississippi, and they put me. They had a big celebration. We filled up the big convention center, and of course they had the speaker. They invited this carpenter, this astronaut, to come and be the speaker. And of course I, and naturally you can know I was pretty emotional anyway. But uh, he gave one of the most moving talks I ever heard in my life. And he talked about courage. And he says, courage is the ability to deal with fear and to manage fear in a crisis. And he talked about when Apollo 13 got lost in space. Did y'all know that? We had a spaceship that got lost. It went out of control in space. And Carpenter brought it in, and his crew brought it in. So Carpenter always said when they realized they was out of control, he still the crew. And he said, we got to do what we've been taught to do. We do he said, they did everything they was taught to do one time. He was still out of control. They did it two times. It was still out of control. They did it three times, and it was still out of control. The fourth time they did it, it caught. Courage is to do one's conviction in the face of fear. Courage is the ability to manage our fear. Heroes are made out of people of courage. You were the person who hit the home run in the World Series in the ninth inning and two outs and the bases loaded. The guy who hit that is never a rookie. Is never a rookie. Is you a person who hit a home run before? Hit a home run before. And is you that person knows what to do? And they come through in the time of need. So we got to teach our young folks. We got to get rid of these. The reason they're carrying these guns to school is that they're fear. They're fearful. They haven't learned how to manage their fear. That's the best thing about athletics. It, it teaches you winning and losing. I don't care how good you might be. You're going to lose. Tiger Woods is going to lose. Everybody's going to lose sometimes. It teaches you how to win. It teaches you how to lose. But these young folks carrying these guns because they haven't had, they have, we haven't inactivated them enough. We haven't got them involved. So we need to be in these places. We need playground. The playground that we own where we can transfer some more value. And that's the crisis we face today. The crisis we are facing today is how can we create an environment where we can create, transfer more values that are stronger than the world values. How do we create that environment to do that? That's what the church was supposed to have been. That's what the church ought to be. That's what the community ought to be. And that's what the playground ought to be. And that's what we ought to be involved in. Let me see, can I come to a conclusion here? Courage. The next one here is identity. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Moses had a good sense of his identity. He knew who he was. Moses, they thought when he met his wife, she thought he was a Jew. But he knew who he was. Have a sense of your, I uh, thought he was an Egyptian there, but he knew who he was. Have a sense of your own identity. But, but don't, uh, this is the best identity. The very fact that you was created in the image of God and have inherited value. Amen. And you're Hispanic, you're black, you're white. Be proud of that. Be proud of that. What messes up is that we think that ours is better than somebody else's. And then we create that foolishness of racism. Racism is foolishness. I, I love the little children's theology. It's better than our theology. Listen to the children's theology. God loves the little children. All the children of the world, brown and yellow, black and white, they all are precious in his sight. God loves the little children of the world. That's good theology. 
That's biblical theology. And so you got to have a strong sense of your own identity. You, you got to know yourself. You got to know, I know who I am. I know who I am. Sometimes, you know, I have been appointed to a couple of presidents, commission, and when I do that, you know, you'll be another black. They'll get up there and they'll try to make the people think because they've been to Harvard, they've been to Stanford, and they'll get up there and say, well, I went to Stanford and I got a law degree in this and I got a business degree in this and I got a degree in that. And they tell them all, and they're saying that to let the white folks know that they're going to be okay. That they're doing that. And, uh, and uh, <laughs> they're okay. And, and I get up there, I, mean, I don't have none of those degrees. I'm a third grade dropout. When it comes my time to come up there, I said, uh, uh, I know why I'm here. Uh, I'm here because I'm black. They needed a quota. <laughs> they, they, they needed a quota. I said, but I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. You know, I have my sense of identity. And, and I said, I'm, and the, the, the other black will say, I just happen to be black. I said, I didn't happen to be black. My mama was black. My grandmother was black. My great grandmother was black. I, 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 said, I said, but okay, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm gonna do fair. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. You, you need to have a good sense of your identity and lead out of identity. Finally, uh, the next one, uh, uh, the sixth one, seventh one, <laughs> a sixth one, the next point uh, is, is uh, Moses was willing to suffer with his people. That's the problem today. That's the problem today. That's what affirms prosperity. We all can prosper. Look at me. Look at me. Y'all just having to buy me an airplane uh, to go with. Y'all can have that too. Just serve God. Serve God. Y'all can be like me. That prosperity theology is giving people a false hope in life. And that we're not willing then to suffer. We got to be willing to sacrifice for our people. Moses rejected the treasures of Egypt. And he was willing to suffer for a day. But he understood the value of his suffering. He recognized the fact that he was going to have something more valuable than gold in society. We got to get some new values. We got to bring human suffering and human development. We got to make that the highest value. We got to become toe nut, show nut, pro-life. I'm a pro-lifer. But some of my folks are pro-life before they get here. They will care a lot about the feeder. I love the feeder. Couldn't be no baby without that. But I boy, when that feeder is born, I love them too. We got to work with these that we get born. We got to love them before they are born. We got to love them after they are born. We got to be absolutely pro-life. Absolutely pro-life in society. And so we got to have a, be willing to suffer with the people uh, of God. Last and finally, here. Leaders lead. Leaders lead. What do God call for the leaders? He called us to be faithful. Put that down. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. And what is faithfulness? Faithfulness is using your faith. Faithfulness is living by faith. The righteous and the just shall go on living by faith. Moses led them across the, the Dead Sea. The sea. He was faithful. So I, let me say this then, in concluding. Where is our people who want to nurture the family? God is looking for people. Let's shape our ministries around families. I came to Christ because I was out there in the world, and my young son, some child evangelism people, got my little son and told him the stories about Jesus, and he fell in love with Jesus, and he came home, and he got me. And then I brought my whole family. If we work with families, we work with children, let's work with the children. Let's work with the little children, and use all those children, and love them, and bring them, and bring the families in to society. Who is the family people? Where is the people who are going to use faith, is going to be faithful? If you're going into the urban community, if you're not giving yourself for seven years being there, you, aren't, you shouldn't go there. I don't mean, we need all the volunteers we can get for tutoring and all of that. 
But I'm talking about when you're going into a community, you're talking about changing culture and changing behavior. You're talking about about seven years it takes you to make a difference in society. So where are our people who are going to go in there and be faithful? Who are going to shape the purpose of young people? Who are going to work with them and build their courage in society? It's going to help them to have a good, healthy sense of themselves and those who are going to create an environment of love where you can really discipline. I'm going to close with this last one. I go to prison all the time. And there's young people. I work with these kids in prison who have done something. These are the kids who done murdered, did all of this, and I work with them. And uh, they all call me uh, Grandpa Perkins. But when the new ones come in, they would call them Grandpa Perkins because others call them Grandma Perkins. And I tell them, y'all, you can't call me Grandpa Perkins. I say, you, I got to give you permission to call me Grandpa Perkins. And I said, everybody who become my grandchildren has a certain behavior. And I said, now, if you, if you want to be my grandchild, I said, you want to be, yeah, I want to, I want to call you grandpa. Okay. I said, now, but you know what happens to me? That sets up some discipline. I can, I can say something to him. I can talk to him. I can say, you're not my grandchild behaving like that. My grandchildren don't behave like that. You said that. You got to set up that environment of love. An environment of love. And that's what makes families got that opportunity. They're the ones that love them. The only reason you can discipline your children is because they love you. In line. Okay.